Cool, good afternoon everyone. So we're gonna get started. Nice to see a, a good full room, lots of people interested in DNS this afternoon. Um, so we've decided we wanted to put a few ground rules in place for this afternoon. So this is where we're gonna start the session. First of all, I think you've all heard the phrase, it's always DNS. Well, this session, that's absolutely what it's about. So if you were expecting something different, you're in the wrong room. It's a 200 level session. So those of you that are not familiar with kind of the structure and the numbering of reInvent, what this means is that this is an overview session. This is basic kind of fairly beginner level stuff that we wanna give you a, a grounding so you can take it from here and then expand your knowledge on this service going forwards. So we're gonna talk about use cases, how to basically use our service to do things like transfer domain names and things. And that brings us on to the topics that we plan to cover. So put simply, we're gonna be talking about domain name registration and transfers. We're gonna be talking about things like DNS security extensions and permissions and management of your zones within AWS. Now the other thing that's really important, you've got two Brits on the stage here. <laughs> the word is root. I've had this conversation before in the past. For the Americans in the room, I think in this case we actually agree you refer to it as root 66. And actually, if you look at the logo for Route 53, we kind of took some inspiration from that. So for the rest of this session, we're gonna be referring to it as Route 53, and there is no discussion on that, okay? <laughs> Perfect. So my name is Steve Seymour. I'm a Senior Principal Solutions Architect at AWS. I lead our networking function across the Solutions Architecture team. And hi, I'm Kimberly Clements. I'm a Senior Solutions Architect at AWS, and today is actually my one-year anniversary at AWS. <laughs> So here it is, the Unicorn Packet website, built with resiliency in mind, hosted in the London region, EUS2, with failover routing policy configured to the island region, EUS1. We've migrated the domain name into another provider, uh, in from another provider into Route 53, and we've turned on multiple features, including DNSSEC, query login, and IAM. And there you have it. That's the end, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> I'm just joking, promise. So what we wanted to do today was to work backwards, show the finished result, and then dive deeper into how we got there. Now you may be thinking, work backwards. Well, at Amazon, we're always innovating on behalf of our customers, and how we do that is by starting with the customer and working backwards. We dive deeply to understand what the customers like, want, need, where they have frustration, but it's not being close enough to the customer and asking them, like, what do you want? It's about deeply understanding their situation to invent on their behalf. So without further ado, we're going to take you on a journey of the Unicorn Packet website. And firstly, caveat that I think it's beautiful, but we have to caveat that we're networking people here. Website design really isn't our forte. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the agenda, the journey we're going on together. And I'm going to firstly take you through what is a domain name. So we saw the end product website before, but what was that text we typed in there to get there? And well, how did we get there as well? web1.unicornpacket.com. So in order to tell you this, I first need to explain what DNS is. Now DNS, it stands for Domain Name System, and I'm sure some of you already know this in the room, but I wanna take everybody on this journey together and explain the DNS theory, and how I'm gonna do that is with an example. So imagine you have a web server connected to the internet, hosting the Unicorn Packet website. Well, that web server is gonna have an IP address 192.0.2.11. Now that IP address in particular is from the documentation range RFC 5737, but IP addresses as a whole are how computers, smartphones and tablets and other IP enabled devices communicate with one another. Now, humans, we don't really like numbers, do we? We prefer names, easy to memorize, easy to type in. Can you imagine trying to remember that IP version six address to get to a website? So in order to give that website a human readable name, like web1.unicornpacket.com, we need something to translate it into an IP address so that other devices can connect to it. Introducing DNS, and simply put, it does that translation. Now, DNS isn't just one server. It's a worldwide network of servers belonging to different entities, and they all talk to each other. There's no single source of truth. It is very large and distributed, and any one server only knows a small piece of the domain name system, what it's responsible for, or a pointer to another part of the system. So with that in mind, we are gonna 
break apart the human readable name, web1.unicornpacket.com, explain what each part of it is, going right to left, starting with that dot. Now you may be asking, where did that dot come from? <laughs> So DNS is structured into um, a hierarchy using different managed zones, and at the very top is root. The root name server, uh, the dot seen on the screen is a root name server in the root zone, and um, <coughs> root name servers can directly answer queries for records stored within their, um, their zone, or provide a refer, or refer request to an appropriate top-level domain. Now, com is a top-level domain, sitting directly below root in the hierarchy. Um, and there are two types of top-level domains, generic and geographic. Generic give users an idea of uh, what they'll find on the website, .com for commercial, .org for organization. There's even .net for network providers. And then geographic is to do with countries or cities. So this is like... UK, United Kingdom, woo, and dot United States, dot US for the United States. Now, um, the top level, like for example, the COP, the COM top level domain, um, they share commonalities for domains that share the same um, top level domain. So if you think about it, I'll explain that a bit better. Uh, any website belonging to of dot com, so unicornpacket.com, will be known about by the, the COM top level domain. So as you're starting to see, we're breaking apart the human readable address web1.unicornpacket.com. Each part has a uh, each part of that address has a has a, a job to do. So this is a delimiter. So it's used to specify a boundary. Unicorn packet is a second level domain, and it's sitting directly below um, the com top level domain. Unicorn packet coupled with the uh, top level domain com. Unicornpacket.com was a purchased domain name, um, and it was registered with the domain name registrar. Some of you don't know, a registrar is a company accredited by ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and it processes requests for specific top-level domains. Delimiter is stated before, it's that boundary. And then we have Web1, and this is a third-level domain sitting directly below Unicorn Packet in the hierarchy. Third level domains give you a way to um, structure contents in a meaningful way. So web one refers to a web server serving up the Unicorn Packet website. But you could have web two, web three, web four, serving up different contents from the Unicorn Packet business. So I'm gonna reiterate this. DNS is hierarchical. Com is, is the subdomain of root. Unicorn Packet is the subdomain of com. And web one is the subdomain of Unicorn Packet. And combined, they are a fully qualified domain name, also known as an FQDN. Now, I said we talk about how we got there on that web browser. So we're going to actually go through how we resolve um, web1.unicornpacket.com from um, the client. Before I get into that, mention name servers a couple of times. Name servers can be authoritative or non-authoritative. Authority name servers contain information about the domain name it serves and uh, will provide the answer to queries known about in their zone files. Now, non-authoritative um, name servers contain information about, um, sorry, don't contain the original zone files. However, they may point to another server or serve up cache content. So bear that in mind as we go through. So you sat there on a laptop, you open up a web browser, type in web1.unicornpacket.com, hit enter. First thing that's gonna happen is the local cache is checked, doesn't know the answer, so it forwards it on, to a DNS resolver. Now, a DNS resolver is typically managed by your ISP, internet service provider, or a corporate network. <clears throat> and essentially, its job is to act on behalf of the client, to communicate to different servers, to find the IP address of the domain name you typed in. It will then cache that information and then return the IP address back to the client. Now, I just mentioned cache. So this is a great time to talk about time to live, TTL. So TTL, Time to Live, is a setting that dictates to that DNS resolver how long to cache that information before, before going out and requesting a new one. But we're going to tell a story. There's nothing in the cache. Resolver doesn't know about web1.unicornpacket.com, but it does know about roots. So it forwards a request onto a root name server. Now, the root name server doesn't know about web1.unicornpacket, but it knows about com. So it responds to the resolver with a name server for com. 
the top level domain. So the resolver forwards the request onto the top level, a top level domain uh, name server. Now, web, the um, top level name, top TLD name server, <laughs> uh, doesn't know about web one, but it knows about unicorn packet. Remember before I said that uh, common TLD knows about domain names that share commonalities, so that's why it knows about that. So it responds to the DNS resolver with the unicorn packet name server. Next, the DNS resolver sends a request on to the unicorn packet name server. Now, the unicorn packet name server is authoritative for this, um, for unicorn packet .com. So it looks within its own file, looks for the associated record for web1.unicornpacket.com and uh, gets the associated value, which is an IP address, 192.0.2.11, which is a web server. And then it returns the IP address back to the resolver. The resolver finally has the IP address that it requires. So what it does is it caches that information for the time specified in that time to live so that next time somebody uh, browses to that address, it can respond more quickly and not do that process again. And then it returns the IP address back to the, the client, which can then go directly to web1.unicornpacket.com with the IP address and then display the um, Unicorn Packet website. And there you have it. That's what happens when you type in an address. So, as we saw before, um, web1.unicornpacket.com was eventually identified as a record in a zone. Now, there are many types of uh, DNS common record types. However, a point to mention here that is, is in AWS terms, we call these resource record sets. <clears throat> so there's a few shown on the screen there. I'll just call out a few of them. So we have the A record, routes traffic to an IP version 4 address. A stands for address. Um, so think about the web server serving up the Unicorn Packet uh, website. But if that web server was to have an IP version 6 address, you could use the Quad A record. And then lastly, another one to po point out is a C name record. It states route traffic to another domain. Well, you can create a C name record, call it web1.unicornpacket.com, and you can actually route it to a completely different domain name. So let's have a little talk about something more specific to AWS now. The Amazon Route 53 alias record provides a Route 53 specific extension to DNS functionality. And you can use alias records to route traffic to selected AWS resources. So you can see them on, see them on the screen there. So you can do an S3 bucket at the website endpoint. Um, you can do Amazon Cloud for distribution. You can do an application load balancer. You can even route one record to another in a hosted zone. So queries to qualify an alias records are provided at no extra cost. And when you use alias records to route traffic to AWS resources, uh, Route 53 automatically responds to any changes in that resource. For example, I've got a, an elastic load balancer routing traffic to uh, the Unicorn Packet website. If an IP address was to change on that elastic load balancer, Route 53 would automatically start responding to queries with the new IP address. Now, I've just talked about something we haven't talked about, so a few new concepts there, Route 53 being one of them. And I'm now going to hand over to Steve, who's going to take you through that. Cool. So you've got a good grounding now in DNS. We just need to put the pieces together of how does this fit with our service that is Route 53 itself. So what is Route 53? Well, it provides actually many DNS functions. Um, we're not going to focus on all of them, but you can see a list on the screen there. Things like private hosted zones, public hosted zones, integration with on-premises resolvers, that kind of thing. If that's the topics that you're really interested in and want to dig into, into the, in the future, there's actually been some previous reInvent sessions on those. In this session, though, we're going to focus primarily on the first two items on this list. So first of all, domain name registration services, acquiring a domain name in the first place or perhaps transferring one, and then public authoritative DNS. So exactly the scenario that Kim told you about, you want to set up a domain name, you want to set up, say, a website on the end of that, how does that resolve? How do we provide that functionality? So first of all, let's talk about domain name registration. Now, one of the things to consider here is that there are two pieces to a domain name registration. There's first of all the piece where you register the domain name and establish ownership for it. So when Kim and I were planning this session and thinking about what should we call our website, came up with Unicorn Packet. So we are the owners of unicornpacket.com. 
The second piece then is the delegation of that. So the entry in the zone files that Kim described to you. So putting an entry in the .com zone file, for example, that's the delegation process. Now, in terms of the top level domains that we support, we are using .com for Unicom Packet. There's obviously .net, .org, as Kim was telling you. There are many country code specific um, top level domains as well. Uh, we support over 200 of the, the more generic top level domains. And the ComNet and Org are perhaps the more traditional ones. There are now many more. In terms of the country double codes, um, these cover pretty much all of the countries that, that are registered with ISO country codes. So in terms of our concepts here, unicornpacket.com is owned by the, the unicorn company. That's us. Unicorn Packet has been entered into the .com zone file. So what does that actually mean? Let's have a, a close look. You've probably heard of the concept of a who is record. You do a who is on a domain name. Well, that's the registration process. That's establishing the record of who owns this domain name. And if you go back a number of years, actually you would see here very clear details that this would say, this is Stephen Kim's domain name. Well, now there's a lot more focus around the privacy of that information. So many domain name registrars offers a, a service where you can actually hide that. The details are still there with the registry. They need that information, but it's not necessarily visible in the who is but it does establish that this domain name is in fact registered. So you can see at the bottom there, there's the privacy enabled piece. The second piece of that, the delegation, well, what I've done here is I've pulled a copy of what's called the .com zone file. So this is what is maintained up at those generic top level domain name servers. And actually, if you look closely, a little bit of an eye test, I realize you can see that unicornpacket.com has been entered into that zone file. This happened when we registered the domain name. So that's the two pieces that we're talking about. The registration establishing the ownership and the delegation in the .com zone file. And they can both be done independently. They don't have to be done with the same provider. Um, they can be done with perhaps a, a registrar for one thing and then with something like Route 53 for the actual hosting of that zone. So how do you register a domain name in Route 53? Well, it really is quite simple. And this is the process that we went through at the beginning for unicompacket.com. You simply type it into the console you choose which top level domain you want it under, so in this case, .com, and you check whether it's available. Once you've done that, it's simply a case of providing contact details, and we will then register it for you. And you can see the, the three sets of traditional contact details here. It's administrative, it's technical, and it's billing. This is kind of a holdover from many, many years ago, but we still have to provide that information. Privacy protection is then enabled, so that information is not publicly put into the WHOIS record. There's also something else quite specific here that I've highlighted in red, which is that we will create a public hosted zone for this in Route 53 when you register the domain name. So we're actually gonna do both of those steps for you. We're gonna register it, where they're gonna put the entry in the .com top level domain to delegate it to Route 53. So what does that actually look like? When the domain name is registered in Route 53, um, you can then see the name servers that it was delegated to. And just to, to a point here, these can be different name servers, and you're gonna see some examples of this when we talk about transferring a domain name later on. Now, the process for transferring a domain name is actually very similar. It's pretty much the case of just go and type the domain name into the search bar again, check it's available, but this time for transfer. And in this case, we're gonna be checking a couple of other things. Obviously, the domain name is already registered, so it's not the same check as a new registration. But we do need to check the status of it. There are things that you can do to a domain name to prevent it being transferred by accident, for example, or if it's only been recently registered. It has to stay with the current registrar for a little bit longer. So there are things we have to go and validate. But assuming that everything passes those checks, it is then just a case of clicking next. Now, we've got our domain name in Route 53, whether it was through registration or through transfer, and we now need to look more closely at actually the authoritative DNS for it. So first of all, those name servers we allocated four Route 53 name servers to that registration record. And they're the examples that are highlighted on the screen here. And those name servers are actually within four different top level domains themselves. So you can see there, they're placed within comnet and org um, and also .co.uk. And that's so that we can provide a fully resilient service for Route 53 and provide the 100% SLA for resolving domain names. Now, these are what we call the stripes. These are the name server stripes within Route 53. And when you register a domain name and you request a delegation set, which are these four name servers, we will provide four unique name servers for each domain name that is set up on Route 53, with only two of them ever overlapping. So this is part of the, the resilience story around Route 53. Another piece to consider 
is that actually, of course, there aren't just four of these name servers placed around the world for this particular domain name. We use something called Anycast, which in Route 53 is basically the case that each of these name servers have exactly the same IP address. So we're looking at one name server on the screen here, and this has one IP address. But it's actually hosted in multiple of our edge locations around the world, and BGP will actually announce that into the route tables for all of our end customers to query. So actually, depending on where you are, you might hit a particular instance of that name server nearest to you. And if, for example, there's something that impacts that connectivity, you'll simply be routed to the next closest one. Now, IPv6, uh, a topic dear to my heart here. Route 53 clearly supports everything that you will need from an IPv6 perspective. So our Route 53 name servers are available on IPv4 addresses as well as IPv6 addresses. You can obviously create entries in the zone file. You saw earlier Kim talked about the records that you can put in there, the quad A record. That's a reference to an IPv6 address, fully supported, obviously, in Route 53. And also, in terms of our health checking, the ability to see whether an endpoint is available and whether we should route request to it, that's also fully supportive of IPv6 as well. I mentioned health checks there. Health checks are a really key capability of Route 53 because this is what lets you dynamically change entries in a Route 53 zone, so in a domain name, based on something else. So is a website responding? Is your server up and running? Is this particular load balancer available? Well, if it is, then you could return one entry. If it isn't, perhaps you want to do something else. So let's talk about a couple of different checks that we can do in terms of the, the health check process. So we can obviously look at an endpoint. So Route 53 can ping this endpoint and say, are you available? If that's the case, we'll then respond with a particular entry, and if it's not, we'll respond with something else. We can also check the status of other health checks. So we can have a look and say, based on these three health checks, perhaps these three key servers for your particular infrastructure or EC2 instances that are running, if two out of the three are available, we'll respond with a positive answer and give one particular address for your website. Perhaps you can respond if two out of three is working. Perhaps if it went down to a single one, at that point we should return a different address, maybe a static website. I'm giving you a bit of a tease for where we're heading with our, our Unicorn Packet website later on. We can also look at CloudWatch alarms. So in the case of an EC2 instance that's running, if perhaps this is not an EC2 instance that's reachable over the public internet, or perhaps it has a security group on it denying general access, we can also go and just check the alarm status in CloudWatch for that EC2 instance, and again, return a different DNS result based on that status. We don't actually have to be able to reach the instance itself. We can take that dependency by looking at the CloudWatch alarms instead. In terms of what else you can do in CloudWatch with Route 53, we monitor the metrics for the DNS queries, so you can see how many queries are coming in for your particular domain name. And we also pull the data for those health checks. So you can actually go and see at a glance which of the health checks are currently passing or failing, all easily accessible in the CloudWatch dashboard. Now, talking about DNS queries there, you saw the graph of the volume of queries that we have, but perhaps you want a little bit more detail. What are people actually querying in your domain name? And what are you responding with? So it's quite simple to turn on query logging in Route 53. It really is a case of just going to this particular console, putting in a log group name, hit save, and at that point, you have access to the query logs. And in the query logs, you can see each name that was queried, whether it was a response saying this was a successful query or perhaps it was an invalid name that was queried. And you actually also get a hint in there as to where it, which, which of our resolvers actually provided the answer. So in this case, it was coming from one of our resolvers, I think, in Japan. So there's a lot of detail available to you in Route 53 query logging. But you can, of course, go one step further than that and graph that data. So all of this information becomes available to you if you have your public hosted zone hosted in Route 53. You can pull metrics and get insights based on the data for your domain name. We have talked about the concept of a zone file or hosted zones a couple of times now. Well, what actually are these? So in Route 53 terms, we have two types of hosted zone, public and private. And this session is very much focused on the public hosted zone side of things. But I didn't want to skip over the concept of private hosted zones completely. So a few differences between them. So first of all, public hosted zones are intended for things that are facing towards the internet. The clue is in the name there, public. It is intended to be resolvable from the internet. Those Route 53 name servers that we assign to the to the domain name are reachable across the public internet. 
The opposite is true inside a private hosted zone. Private hosted zones are intended to refer to things that are inside perhaps a VPC. You can't query those from outside that VPC. Well, you can technically. You can do that via Route 53 resolver endpoints and some of the things that I talked about at the beginning of the section. And I'd refer you to those other sessions on Route 53 to dig into more detail on that. You can also do, on a public hosted zone side, delegation. Obviously, for this tool to work, what we've been talking about, the idea of delegating from .com down to Unicorn Packet, that has to work from a public hosted zone perspective. But on the private hosted zone side, it's not something that's required. So there's a few other things that are, that are different between the two, but that's kind of the, the highlights of them. Let's look a little bit more closely at the, the functions that you can actually provide and achieve with public hosted zones. So first of all, you get that delegation set. That's the key thing when you create a public hosted zone in Route 53. We will then provide those four name servers that you can then go and delegate the registration to. Resource record sets are common across both private and public, the A records, the C name records, and even the alias configuration that Kim mentioned. Time to live in caching, that's standard DNS, setting how long that information is cached at a resolver. DNS set configuration, more on that a little bit later on. And obviously all of the query logging, et cetera, that I showed you a moment ago. On the private hosted zone side, a really important concept to consider is if we create a private hosted zone for a domain name, and we are then querying that inside a VPC, it takes priority over anything outside of the VPC in terms of public DNS. So it allows you to create something called a split view. Some of you may be familiar with that concept, but it means you can actually have a different response to a domain name based on whether you're querying it from inside your VPC or outside. You can then create these private hosted zones, and rather than doing it multiple times across perhaps multiple VPCs and accounts, you can then share that private hosted zone easily across all of your different accounts and just manage it in one simple central place. So, there's a couple of new concepts in there. One of the key ones that I talked about was health checks, and it's interesting how you might use those in terms of root pol routing policies. And now I'm going to take you through, um, now that Steve's covered Route 53, some routing policies. So when you create a record, what we went through earlier, you choose a routing policy which determines how Route 53 is going to respond to queries. And now there's seven shown on the screen there, and I'm going to go through them um, with some more description and some diagrams and animation. So first one, simple routing, emphasis on the simple. So it's used to route traffic to a given resource in your domain, for example, the web server. You serve the new Compacket website. Now, weighted routing policy, you can use this to route traffic to resource of your domain um, using proportions that you specify. So if you look on the screen there, at the bottom, the white table, um, you've got two resources there. Um, one's got a weight of 50, the .11 IP address. The other one's got a weight of 30, the .12 IP address. And when queried by the resolver, the answer is going to be the .11 address because it's got the highest weight. Geolocation routing policy is used when you want to route traffic to resources based on the locations of your users. And you can actually specify the locations via country, continent, or state in the United States. Latency-based routing, this is um, used when you have resources in multiple AWS regions and you want to route traffic to the region that finds the best latency or less round trip time. And then we've got multiple uh, value answer routing policy. And this is when you want Route 53 to respond um, to, uh, with, well, with, respond with an answer uh, to up to eight healthy records. So when you use it this way, the health of each resource is checked, and if Route 53 will only res uh, return healthy resources. Now here we have IP-based routing. And so in June this year, AWS announced this IP-based routing, and you can use it to route traffic to uh, resources in your domain based on the client subnet. And you can fine tune DNS routing decisions using your understanding of the network client and applications to make the best DNS routing decisions for your end users. So how it works is you'll create a, uh, a set of CIDR blocks, CIDR standing for classes into domain routing, and then these will map to the client IP network ranges, or they'll represent the client IP network ranges, 
And then after that, you will map them to a location. So you can see on the screen there's Sydney. And then once mapped, it's known, referred to as a CIDR collection. And then how it works when queried is if the IP value in the um, DNS resolver matches one of the subnets for a given location, like Sydney, then Route 53 will respond with a corresponding um, answer in the resource record set. And then lastly, we've got failover. I'm going to go into more detail in a bit later. We'll configure this. Um, this is essentially using those health checks that uh, Steve mentioned before. So the health of the first resource is checked in primary. And if that was to um, fail, then you fail over to the second resource. That's how it would respond. So that covers the routing policies, which I wanted to take you through before we had to go through talk about Route 53 first. And I'm now going to come on to DNS security. And within that is DNSSEC. Now, DNSSEC stands for Domain Name System Security Extensions, and it's a layer on top of DNS. So why would you need it? Well, DNS doesn't provide any security mechanisms, so you don't really have any certainty of the answer you'll get. And DNSSEC adds that um, mechanism to confirm the results of a query. I love an example. So imagine you're a user and you're querying a resolver for the Unicorn Packet website. Now that resolver will go through that same process we saw before on that animated slide to get the IP address of the domain name and return it back to the user. However, a bad actor could take over that resolver, inject a different IP address known as DNS spoofing, DNS cache poisoning, and ultimately, the user will end up on a fake website. So coming back to AWS, um, back to um, Route 53 and everything, um, when you use DNSSEC signing, it lets a resolver confirm that a result came from Route 53 and has not been tampered with. And when you use DNSSEC signing, every result from a hosted zone is signed using public key cryptography. So remember the records we went through earlier? Well. DNSSEC adds another record type. It's called RRSIG, Resource Record Set Signature. And it's essentially like the signature of that A record signed using public key cryptography. But let's see how we set it up for unicornpacket.com. I'm going to take you through that now. So, so if you head over to the host is own unicornpacket.com, you can simply, in the orange box there, uh, select Enable DNSSEC Signing. And next, you will... Uh, create or choose a customer managed key, CMK. And this um, CMK will be used to sign a KSK, which is a key signing key, key exchanges. <laughs> so um, next thing we'll do, that's what the KSK looks like. And this KSK is going to be used to sign the zone and any subsequent records. The next step is where we're going to add um, the DS record, which is a delegation signing record to a parent. So if you head over to view information, create DS record. What we're doing here is we're establishing a chain of trust. The um, DS record needs to be kept at the top level domain. And in the case of unicornpacket.com, uh, top level domain is com, and that's the parent. So the DS record is pushed to com. So if you search where the orange box is, root for three registrar. And then what you're going to do is take a copy of the public key, select manage keys, select the correct uh, key type and algorithm, and then you paste that public key back in there. And at that point, DNSSEC is implemented. What if you wanted to dive a little bit deeper and um, let's enable DNSSEC validation in a VPC? So if you head over to root 53 resolve of VPCs, you see on the tab on the uh, left there, Select your desired VPC, and then you simply tick that box, enable DNSSEC validation in the VPC. And that's what it looks like implemented, the green tick. And then let's have a look what it look, looks like for real. So on the left-hand side, this is uh, showing you, when I look up unicornpacket.com, it shows you the RSIGs, those resource record set signatures. And then to show DNSSEC working requires a bit of a comparison. So on the right there, um, the top box is an EC2 instance in that VPC that we just enabled DNSSEC validation on. The bottom in blue, that's a local client with no uh, 
no DNSSEC validation enabled. It's actually my client, my, my laptop, so I don't have that. <laughs> um, so what they're doing is they're both uh, looking up the same uh, domain name, uh, which I'm going to add is designed to fail. And as you can see, the EC2 instance in the uh, VPC that has validation enabled gets a serve fail, doesn't provide an IP address in the answer. And then the bottom half, the local client, it does indeed get an IP address and an answer. And there you have it. That's DNS security. I'm going to hand over to Steve now. Yeah. So hopefully from that, you can see that whilst DNSSEC, it can be a, a bit of a, a complex topic, it's actually quite easy to implement on the AWS side of things. Simple checkbox for validation and just copying and pasting a couple of keys around to enable it. So kind of take away from this session, perhaps you want to enable that on your domain names if you have them in Route 53. So it's time to kind of pull some of these threads together. And one of the ideas that we had behind this session was actually to take you through the process we went through when we actually brought in a new domain name, transferred it into use it for Unicorn Packet as well. And that's the kind of thing that customers talk to us about regularly. Customers might have one or two domain names, might have thousands of domain names, and they're looking for that process of how do you transfer that into Route 53. And perhaps that's the challenge that some of you in the room have got here. So let's start there. Let's talk about transferring a domain name and the actual steps involved in a level of detail that I didn't cover before. So first thing, start considering, does Route 53 support the top level domain that you need to transfer in? And we support most of them. There are a couple of exceptions here and there. Go and check the dates on that particular domain that you're going to transfer in. When was it registered? When does it currently expire? If you're going to be bringing in lots of domain names into Route 53, that's absolutely fine. But we set a couple of quotas on your account in AWS that just limit that initial number. So you can just raise a support request and ask for that to be increased. When you're transferring a domain name, there's a stage in the process here where you may want to be referring to other domain name servers elsewhere. And in that case, it's worth remembering that Route 53 supports a maximum of six entries uh, on a domain name registration or transfer. In terms of support, Route 53 actually has support available for you when you go to, to do a domain name transfer. So if you're not sure about any of the steps, you're concerned this might impact perhaps your own website, you don't want to see an interruption in service there, use our support team. They're available for you through the transfer process. And perhaps it's obvious to say, try and test the process first. Don't make the first domain name transfer you do into Route 53 be your production domain name that everyone is using every single day. Once you've ironed out the process, worked out what you want to achieve here, just simply repeat it. Do exactly the same things over and again. I mentioned the domain name expiry and various other statuses earlier. There are a number of statuses that can be applied to a particular domain name registration. Um, you can go and look them up. They're on the ICANN website. The ones that are particularly relevant for transferring a domain name into Route 53 are the ones listed here. Some of them are pretty self-explanatory. You know, transfer prohibited, well, that means a flag has been set that says do not allow this domain name to be transferred. It's also known as domain name locking. Uh, pending delete, if the domain name's expired and it's gonna be deleted, the registry is not gonna allow you to transfer it to Route 53. So you kind of get the idea. If you go and check on these statuses, you can see which ones are relevant for your particular domain name. These also show up when you do a who is on that domain. So you can see quite clearly the state that's being applied. So the high level steps, talked about testing the process. That is absolutely key. I can't say it enough times. You don't want to have an impact on your service because you skipped a step or you weren't sure on a particular piece of it. Separate out the two things I talked about earlier, both the delegation and then the transfer or registration. It's similar in that sense. The two are separate pieces. You don't have to do both of them together. When you're starting to modify anything to do with DNS, drop the time to live values down as low as possible. Because at that point, whilst it increases the load on the domain name system, it means when you make changes, they're going to take effect much quicker. Go and create the public hosted zone in Route 53. This doesn't impact anything that's live for you at that moment in time. You create the public hosted zone, we'll assign you four name servers, no one's querying them at this point. So you can do that in advance. Make a note of the delegation set that we give you, those four Route 53 name servers. And then only when you're ready, go and update the registrar delegation to point at those name servers. At that point, Route 53 did become live for you. We are now responding to queries. At that point, you can transfer the domain name. Once that's done, actually transfer it into the Route 53 registrar. 
And then finally, if you had DNSSEC enabled, re-enable it at this point. You don't want to transfer a domain name with DNSSEC enabled. Um, if you hadn't, didn't have it enabled before, you now know how to do that. So that public hosted zone creation. A couple of things just to consider. The delegation set is the key piece, the four name servers. They're authoritative for your domain name. But you probably have a lot of entries already in your DNS. How are you going to bring those over to route 53? So there is a concept here of the standard bind zone file format. It's been around for a long time. It's tied to the original uh, name server software that was created, bind. And it's a standard that pretty much all domain name providers support. So if you can get a copy of the bind format zone file from your current provider, that makes it really easy to import into root 53. You can actually do it in the console, which I'm going to show you in a moment, or use some of the third party tools that are out there. CLI 53 is one that I use regularly, for example. Once you've done that, you can then take advantage of some of the other features we have in Route 53, things like routing policies, things that are not perhaps in other DNS providers' capabilities. So let's have a look at transferring that zone file in or importing that zone file. This is what I'm referring to as a standard bind format zone file. Might look familiar to some of you. You can actually see the previous uh, DNS provider is listed there. That's unicorndns.net. And that's who we're transferring it away from and into Route 53. So it really is as simple as going and pulling up that zone file, copying it, and pasting it into this particular screen in Route 53. There's a helpful button there that says, you know, import this zone file. You just simply paste in that text. You haven't got to think about the formatting. Once you do that, we then immediately process it on the same screen and show you at the bottom what we're actually going to import. And the reason that's important is there are some things that were in that zone file we were looking at that actually aren't important when we bring them into Route 53. So those entries to the Unicorn DNS, for example, that's the previous provider. We don't need those. We don't need the SOA record at the top. So this shows you what's going to be imported, and it really is as simple as then just clicking Next, and all of those entries are imported into Route 53. And remember, you can do this as soon as you've created the public hosted zone. This isn't live at this point until you update the delegation set. So talking about updating the delegation, this is the point where you do actually shift the queries over towards Route 53. So you do this at your existing provider, wherever the domain name is registered, and you go and update the delegation there. So you add those four name servers in, and this is the time, as we would do at home, to go and make a cup of tea, sit down, and wait. Do not rush this step. Just let the, the propagation time expire on these, let the TTL expire, make another cup of tea, because it'll probably take longer than you're thinking. And then, when you think it's working, just go and create a test entry in Route 53. Add a new entry to a zone file, and just query it. If it responds, you know generally the internet is now seeing your new entries in Route 53. There's also various tools online that you can use to just validate your particular domain name, your DNS entries, to see that they have propagated everywhere. Once that's done, you're now at the stage of actually transferring that registration in. So the domain name is now live, Route 53 is providing responses, but the domain name registration, that ownership information, is still at your previous registrar. So this is where you go back to that screen that we saw earlier on. You put the domain name in. In this case, this was our, our second domain name. This was unicornpackets.com. And we decided we would transfer that in and add it to our capabilities. Now, once that's done, you can go and start looking for other AWS services that use Route 53, because things just suddenly became a lot easier for you. So in this case, looking at things like Workmail. To use Workmail, you need to put some entries into your domain, into your, into your public hosted zone file. You need to create some MX records, some SPF records, et cetera. And of course, you can copy and paste them, but we have what I like to refer to as the easy button. Just click that button, we'll then update the zone file for you because it's hosted inside Route 53. Same for simple email service, SES. So if we take a look now at our public hosted zone, you can see at the top there, they're the entries that were added for Workmail. So unicornpacket.com is now a customer of Workmail. But you also might notice that there's a couple of other entries that have appeared down at the bottom. So what's that about, and how did they get there? And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about now. So we've got the theory behind us, but let's actually set up a routing policy. So here's the current architecture of the Unicorn Packet website. It's built with resilience in mind, as I said before. Um, and it's hosted in the London region E West 2. We've got um, an application load balancer distributing traffic across two availability zones. But the Unicorn Packet website has become certainly, well, very integral to the Unicorn Packet business. And they now have decided that they want to set up a static version of the website. 
in a different region, EUS 1 in Ireland, on an S3 bucket. And we're going to take what we learned along the way about Amazon Route 53. We're going to configure failover. So we've got the individual website hosting. On the left, this is the backup website, say hosted in the island region, uh, EUS 1. And, and it's on an S3 bucket with static website hosting enabled. You'll see from the orange boxes that it provides a publicly available domain name. And we've also made it very obvious that it's the backup website by writing the words backup on it, as you can see. And then on the right there, this is the application load balancer, the current architecture for now, ho with, um, hosting in the London region. And this application load balancer also provides a publicly available domain name. So let's actually head over to Route 53 and start setting up this failover routing policy. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to set up a health check, Steve mentioned before. And how this is how you configure it. So you'll give it a name. You'll choose what to monitor. At this point, it's an, uh, an endpoint. And then you'll provide some details there. So you've got the domain name. Uh, you choose protocol. And then you'll pop in, uh, paste in what uh, that publicly available individual um, domain name from either the application loan balancer or the S3 book in this case. Specify a port and if there is a path. And then you'll cr uh, click Next. The next choice you get to is if you want to be notified when a health check fails. So you can get like a text or an email from Amazon's uh, SNS, Simple Notification Service. Um, but in this case, for this example, we're going to choose no. And this is what the console looks like. So you've got, we'll repeat those steps for each one. But there's two health checks there. Um, as you know, the replication load balance in the S3 bucket. And then if you select one of the health checks as well, you can get further detail. Uh, if you step across to the health checkers tab, and you can see the health checkers around the world and also the status as well, and it's reporting healthy both are at this time. Next, we're going to configure the routing policy. So we'll create the record name, call it www.web1. We're configuring the application load balancer at this time, and that's an AWS resource, and we want to utilize that, the alias that we spoke about earlier. So we'll slide the toggle along just underneath and then configure where to route traffic to. We choose the application load balancer, choose the region, which is the London region, EUS2, and then you'll specify, you'll get the drop down box and if your load balancer, you choose it from there. Then we'll configure the routing policy. And this, we said we're gonna do failover. Um, and then we choose the failover record type, which is um, primary, application load balancer is the primary uh, one we want. We will want. And then we specify the health check ID that we just created before, and then give it a name, and then hit create records. And that's one done. Next thing, we'll do these steps again, but this time it's for the S3 bucket hosted in the island region, EUS1. Give the record a name. And it's the same name, www.web1. But the reason for this is because you don't really want your users to have to remember yet another domain name to get to your backup website. You want it to be obfuscated. Um, away from them so they don't see. So it's the same name. We, we use an AWS resource again, so we're going to drag that toggle to make it an alias. Choose this time to make it um, configure to route traffic to the S3 website endpoint. Specify the region. Choose the S3 bucket that's got the code in it for the website. And then you've got the routing policy to configure, which we said is failover. But this time, it's the secondary. You can put the health check in there, which is optional this time, because it's the primary health that determines if it's going to fail over. Give the record ID a name, and then hit Create Records again. And there you have it in the console. Both, uh, rec you'll see both the routing policies there configured and the records. Um, and then if you look to the right as well, you'll see that the Unicorn Packet website is publicly available at www.web1.unicornpacket.com. Now, let's simulate some failover and see what happens. So as you can see there on the left-hand side, that's the health checks console, and there's a rep, you can see red now. Um, so one of the uh, resources is reporting unhealthy. And if you select it to get some more information in the health checkers tab, and you'll see the status there, and, and that's a great place to fault find to see if there's anything you can do there. But we wanted to fail over this time. So, and then on the right, um, 
you'll see that the Unicorn Packet website is still publicly available at www.web1.unicornpacket.com, but we now know that that's the backup website, which is on the S3 bucket, hosted in the island region EUS1. So there you have it, failover, complete, and tested, and configured. But what if I was to tell you now that the Unicorn Packet business is expanding and we've gone away from our one single AWS account and we're incorporating a multi-account AWS strategy. And to do this, we're going to use Control Tower, AWS Control Tower. Now, I'm not here to talk to you about AWS Control Tower. We're talking about Route 53, don't worry. But the concept of it is you've got the management account at the top and on the bottom right, this is where you, you can have multiple AWS accounts. So think dev, test, prod, et cetera, et cetera. Let me strip this back. As I said, we're here to talk about Route 53. The Unicorn Packet business has decided that they want to place Unic uh, Route 53 in the management account. However, and we're also, to, um, as well, only going to concentrate on one single AWS account at this time, the dev account. Now, there is a developer who's a longtime employee of the Unicorn Packet business, and he's slightly grumpy because before this um, expansion, he, they used to um, access Route 53 all the time, do any changes that they wanted to do, um, as and when they required, basically. So um, in order to currently make any changes, all he wants to do is change a, a record, change a resource record set. So in order to do any changes, he firstly has to fill out a form and then send that form to an administrator and then wait for them to do the changes for them. Now, the Unicorn Packet business knows that the developer is grumpy and they're starting to look at other ways that they can do this better, improve some processes. So they firstly started looking at delegating a hosted zone. Simple to do, the steps are there, listed. Uh, create a hosted zone, uh, delegate a hosted zone, call it dev.unicornpacket.com. However, they know that that developer isn't the only one out there. There are others that used to access Route 53 before, and they don't want to have many delegated hosted zones. They prefer a centralized approach with Route 53 being in the management account. So they're looking at other ways, and they've discovered that they can do it with AWS Identity and Access Management, IAM. And what this is, is, a, is where they'll create a role, define a set of permissions, and then the developer can assume that role um, from the dev AWS account and go into the management account, do the changes that they require, and go from there. But let's see about those permissions that, that you can define on that role. Let's see how granular we can get with them. Firstly, we have AWS managed policies. An emphasis on the manage there, they are created and managed by AWS, and they're four common use cases. Um, let's have a little peek inside Amazon Route 53 full access. Now, again, emphasis on the full access here. You can do domain registration, health checks, and a lot, lot more. But that developer only wants to really change their, their resource record set. They just want to configure that. So this is too permissive for that use case. Another option is to create their own policy. And what's shown on the screen is every available Route 53 action they can use to define the policy. But let's actually take a peek inside them right now, uh, one in particular that's very pertinent to that developer. And here we have something that was launched, um, well, introduced last month. So AWS announced DNS resource record set permissions in September, just gone. I think we're in September, uh, last <laughs> month. <laughs> um, and previously, customers um, could specify permissions only at the hosted zone level. However, this provided authorized, access, uh, authorized users access to all resource record sets, not just the single resource record set that they wanted to change or be responsible for. And now you can specify granular IAM policies to control who can create, edit, or delete individual resource record sets within a public or private hosted zone. So going back to that grumpy developer, well, 
these uh, granular permissions would give them uh, direct ownership at the resource, res resource record set level so that you can actually help rely, uh, stop relying on that administrative team to do those changes, which could reduce operational risks, save time, and let's not also forget a happy developer too. Now, that actually brings me to the end this time, and I really mean the end this time. Promise, sort of. Well, almost. <laughs> one, one last little bit. So let's just summarize what hopefully people have learned in this session. So it is always DNS. Everything in this session has been about DNS, but hopefully now you look at it in a good way. When mistakes are made in DNS, it can be painful. So just pay attention to the time to live value. Drop that down when you're going to be making changes. And the thing to remember is you need to drop it down in advance of the changes, because you've got to let it expire first before you then start making the changes to your zones. You've got a lot of understanding now, hopefully, of how DNS works. For those of you that had a few gaps in that area, hopefully Kim filled in the knowledge there. And also the importance of delegation by those NS records, those name server records. The fact that domain name registration and transfer is a really simple thing to do, easy, accessible in the Route 53 console. And now you also have a good understanding of things like hosted zones, the, res the resource record sets, the different record types that we have. There's a whole bunch of Route 53 specific capabilities. We've touched on some of them here. I'd encourage you to go and dig into the documentation to learn more about them. There is also a lot more to Route 53 that we haven't even touched on here. I mentioned briefly Route 53 Resolver endpoints, how you integrate with an on-premises environment. A lot of detail around that. VPC query logs, the ability to get logging data when people are querying DNS inside your VPC. DNS firewall to filter and limit the responses that are provided back to queries from your VPC. And finally, ARC, Application Recovery Controller. So these are all things for you to go follow up on if you want to carry on your interest in exploring around Route 53 and DNS. So with that, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of both of us. And we really would like your feedback in the application to tell us what should we cover next year in terms of DNS to rise this up yet another level in terms of your knowledge. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.